Hello and welcome to the Organic Gardening Podcast. I'm Sarah Brown and I'm joined by my colleague Chris Collins. We both work at Garden Organic and we'll be talking about how to grow the organic way, helping you along your growing journey. This month I'm hugely excited to meet our guest, Professor Dave Goulson. Many of you may know Dave from his books about bees. We talk about his latest publication called Silent Earth, which discusses the terrifying loss of insect life we're experiencing right now. So within my lifetime, we've lost more than 50% of, of our butterflies have disappeared. It just hadn't occurred to people that we could wipe out nature. And it just seemed impossible, unimaginable that the, the seas would be empty of fish, that there would be no butterflies in the garden. But actually, that's exactly where we're going to be if we don't do something soon. You'll hear more from Dave about what we as gardeners and individuals can do. Later, our post bag includes questions about gooseberry and fruit bush planting. Is it too late to keep sowing this month? And, a big one here, why is organic important? But first, a big thank you to our sponsors, the Organic Gardening Catalogue. They're proud to offer a complete range of organic gardening products, from seeds and plants to equipment. This month, if you're thinking of repotting your plants before the winter, why not look at their range of pots and planters? Check out their catalogue online at organiccatalogue.com. And if you're a member of Garden Organic, you'll get 10% off. So now I'm off to meet Chris in the potting shed. Morning, Sarah. How are you? Morning, Chris. I'm very well, thank you. Having said that, I've got <laughs> cucumbers coming out of my ears, if you can imagine it. <laughs> oh, man, I've got so many cucumbers <laughs> in course. It's, it's hilarious. I've got in my shed, I've got them all stopped. And I say, well, I haven't got a wine cellar, but I've got a good courgette rack. It just Happy looks like one. bottles. <laughs> <laughs> I've never quite so successfully cucumbers. I, my neighbours are sick of them. I'm sick of them. But it's kind of making up for me on tomatoes. I had poor tomatoes this year. And one of the reasons is they simply haven't ripened. Have you found that problem? Well, actually, on my allotment, not just my allotment, but they just blight has wiped them all out this year. Absolutely. And I've read a lot of social media as well. It's been very common. And that's because we've had a grey, humid summer. It's been overcast and it's been humid down south. I think actually most of the country's been the same. And it just, I could see little signs of it. Once it sets in, it just goes bang. And then obviously you have to remove and get rid of it as quick as possible. But it happened on all the allotments around me. So uh, I had a few small moneymaker tomatoes, which is all the big beef tomatoes that I had tons of last year. I lost. You know, it's Mother Nature. She gives you one thing, she takes to the other. Actually, it's been an amazing year. You talk about cucumbers, I've had amazing cucumbers, courgettes as well. And if you don't go down there for two days, it's just a marrow. It's suddenly it's like two foot long. You just the speed of the production. What a plant. I mean, it's just full of energy, isn't it? The courgette. Yeah, yeah. A hundred ways with courgettes and, and cucumbers. <laughs> Mate, I'll be smoking them next. I've got so many. I tell you. <laughs> Perhaps actually this is a good moment to talk about picking and storing because September really is the month for it. The first rule of thumb is that whatever you pick and whatever you store has to be perfect. It's no good trying to store something that's got disease in it or even just a bruise on it because once you've picked a fruit or a veg, that stops the growing process. So that will stop the healing process. So if you've got a bruise, it's just going to get worse. If it's got disease, it's just going to rot, mm. basically. So whatever you store, whether it's a carrot, a turnip or an apple, make sure it's perfect. Carrots and root veg like beetroots and turnips are actually very easy to store because ultimately they are roots. They are the, the storage of the plant itself. So they're good at storing. Yeah. And it's quite simple to keep them cool in a damp box. When I say damp box, I mean a box covered perhaps with damp sand or some sort of very lightly damp, medium light soil. Would you agree, Chris? Yes, certainly. In fact, I'm going to retail a, a little uh, thing I observed a few years ago. I went to an allotment site in Stoke. There they had these old water butts. And what they do with their parsnips, their carrots, is they put them in layers of sand. There's a special name for it, but I can't recall. But that means that they can just tap into it through the winter. Mm. So you're not using space up at home. 
You're not storing it in the garage. You're doing it on an allotment site. So it's just a brilliant little system all yeah. done on site. The other thing that's been a brilliant year I personally had is was being potatoes. I've had so many delicious potatoes. Get how delicious fresh potatoes are. Because yes. the ones you're buying in the supermarket are stored, dry stored. The difference in taste is phenomenal. But I won't, I won't digress. How do you think potatoes? I tend to store mine in a basket in the shed uh, down the allotment. So I'm not burying them in sand. I've got them more air around them. Do you think that's a good idea? I think air is a very good idea. Certainly don't put them in a plastic bag because that will encourage mould and rot. But the important thing with potatoes is to keep them dark. So as long as your basket is well covered or even just in a paper bag, important thing is to keep them in the dark because otherwise any of the bits that are exposed to light will turn green. And that green is actually is potentially poisonous to eat. And also back to this thing about it has to be a perfect example i can't tell you the number of times i've dug up potatoes with a fork and put the fork straight through a potato oh, i've done that it drives me mad sarah it exactly. really does <laughs> but then yeah, that's okay that's ready to eat you know wash and eat it but don't try and store it is what i'm saying I was going to go on to beans, actually, because I've also got quite a few beans growing, lovely climbing French beans, and I'm working hard to keep on top of them. Quite a few of them are going into the freezer, but I've decided to keep some of them and let them go dry. So I've got the dry bean inside the pod, because did you know, Chris, the idea of eating beans in the green is a very modern idea. And by modern, I mean probably only in the last 150 years. Prior to that, everybody ate beans that were dry, dried pulses. Like a lentil, basically, like yes. that sort. Of, so that's a way of storing them, isn't it? We didn't have exactly. fridges, we didn't have freezers. So you dried them and you kept them and you used them through the dark months. That's a great idea, isn't it? And, and But also you can also grow them for seed savings. So you might want to carry them over to the next season. Yeah, absolutely. And the difficulty is, though, in this country, we tend to get quite damp autumns, is if you leave it on the vine to dry, it very often doesn't because rain and whatever will make the pod case go sort of damp and horrible so I pick them and I bring them indoors and I lay them out again separate from each other and watch those pods become sort of dry and crinkly and crackly and then pop them open and there's the fat beans inside Brilliant, yeah. I've got my broad, old broad beans uh, hanging up in the shed, dried out, ready for next year's crop. And it's funny because I get them from a, an old, I'm a, I've said many times, it's all old Cypriot lads on my allotment and they always give me stuff. So I'm trying to keep a, a little seed library going on the allotment, which is lovely, isn't it, to be able to do. We get the most amazing shard on the allotment. So I've been saving those seeds for next year as well. Yeah, there's a, there are plenty of seeds actually you could be saving at the moment. My, I think I have to give a shout out to the performance of my hardy annual borders as well on the allotment this year because those kind of pollinator corridors that I sow down the sides of all my beds I mean it's just such a cheap way to do it I only probably spent 15 quid and it's just been blazes of colour all the way through the allotment all summer it's been so impressive but of course now it's all starting to go over a bit and drying out the plants are collapsing a bit all those seed heads are sitting there poppy uh, corn flowers Californian poppies there's so much I've got there's sunflowers so I'm out with the scissors and I'm chopping all those down and I've got three big envelopes of dried seed in the shed at the allotment and I think I might do I might do a little bit of gorilla gardening with those Sarah oh Chris where are you going to go what are you going to do well I think well there's a car park area not far away from me I might actually go to my local park you know where which is now run by volunteers which often is and I see them out actually uh, seed sowing into neglected areas so I might offer my services and my annual seeds to them which would be quite a nice thing to do so a bit of community and a bit of color all tied in together what a lovely idea really nice one final tip about seed saving which i'm sure we we say each year the important thing when you're saving seeds is to keep them dry cool and dry so yeah. yes in get them thoroughly dry put them into an envelope or some paper bag or whatever. Don't forget to label it. I've been yeah. done that. <laughs> I was going to say, don't forget to label it. Don't get to next spring and say, what is this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're ready to sow next spring. Brilliant. What about taking cuttings? Are you doing that? I will be, yes, because I do. This is the time of year for semi-ripes, really, as we get in towards the autumn. By semi-ripes, basically it means you're taking a bit of growth. You can do this with fruit trees. I'll do it. Conifers is a big one for semi-ripes. There's lots of plants you can do. But what you're doing is you're taking a piece of this year's growth with a little bit of last year's growth. So, for example, with a conifer, we call it a heel. So you'll get a little bit of piece of older wood on the base of it. And you'll see the vascular bundle, which is the area that has the cambium, which is the area that produces the roots. The cambium is the active cells in a plant. So you just make sure you tear it away. 
You can do it by hand on a kind of a tear it away. You've got nice new growth with a little bit of last year's growth. I would then use a bit of organic hormone, which you can get on the market quite easily now. And that would go into a propagator or even a cold frame. Fantastic. And then you've got all sorts of plants to back up next year. To me, propagation, a lot of gardeners will say this, is the funnest bit of gardening. It just it never stops intriguing me after 35 years of professional horticulture. Oh, I love to propagate stuff. It's just exciting. It doesn't always work. It doesn't have to. It doesn't cost really that much money. It's about having fun and experimenting. But also it gives you that very important foundation stone of being a gardener is that if you want to keep a plant, give it away. So propagate it, give it to your friends. And if yours dies, you can go and get it back again. Yes, that's such a good point because I was given a particularly beautiful salvia this year. The blue is just sings. And I thought, I want more of this one. So I'm taking a different sort of cutting from that. I'm cutting this year's growth and I'm cutting just beneath a leaf node, stripping off the bottom leaves just above where I've cut, putting it down into a very light rooting medium, yeah. really light, mixture of sand, tiny bit of soil, bit of vermiculite, keeping it light, free draining. And then that will, I hope, take root. And then I've got potentially salvias all around the garden. We're such generous people gardeners. We love to give away information and plants, etc. Good point about the compost needs to be free draining. You know, silver sand mix with compost and you're away. And it's just, there's nothing like just teasing that cutting out and seeing the roots on it it's just i don't know it's just a, such a wonderful thing it makes you feel a very grown-up gardener doesn't it, <laughs> yeah, it does, almost yeah. like we know what we're doing <laughs> yeah, exactly 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 <laughs> um there is quite a lot of bare soil appearing now isn't there because we're beginning to pull up plants that have passed their best whether it's your in your herbaceous border or your veg patch I'm covering mine with actually, funnily enough, some leaves that I collected last year, autumn leaves. It's not quite rotted down into leaf mold yet, but it's a nice sort of organic mix. And I'm just going to cover my soil a little bit like putting a duvet on to, to keep the soil healthy and warm over winter. Yes, it's a brilliant idea. You don't, I mean, all organic gardeners, all real garden, any gardener really, you don't really want to see bare soil, any kind of soil. Any time of year, you want this soil to be occupied. As Garden Organica, we're big green manure people. So, so we like, what we do is sow this time of year, broadcast sow, so nice and thick, and those plants will germinate and keep that soil occupied throughout the winter into next spring. Now I use mustard or field beans. Uh, Anton would recommend field beans. He loves his field beans. And that's important for quite a few reasons. A green manure will help the drainage because the roots are into it, so it stops it waterlogging. You're stopping leaching. That means the nutrients wash through bare soil if it rains very hard. You're stopping that. You're adding structure to the soil. So basically you're supporting the ecosystem of the soil. One of the biggest ecosystems in the world goes on inside our soil. And by green manuring, you're helping to do that. So that's what I'll be doing. Also have some plants on there. Broad beans are in. I've got Swedes. I've got some Christmas potatoes. I know no one wants to mention Christmas yet, but I'm looking at them every day because I want them roasties on the 25th of December. <laughs> <laughs> Something to look forward to. Yeah. I know actually we've got a question coming up. Somebody's written in saying, is it too late to be sowing this month? So I'll be interested to hear your thoughts on that one, Chris, later. Sure. By the end of September, I'm going to be bringing in some of my outdoor plants that are in pots. So I'm looking now out at my wonderful, wonderful scarlet geraniums. By the end of the month, I want them back indoors, either in the greenhouse or up in the spare room. And I think it's quite good to be quite proactive about, it's not just a matter of bringing them in now to cover. Look at them first, check them thoroughly for pests, look for any diseased leaves or any that have curled up and inside a little tiny caterpillars or whatever. Just make sure they're pest and disease free, then take off the top centimeter of the soil and replace that with gravel then your plant's in a good position to go dormant probably through winter, ready for you to kickstart it and it's growing back early next spring. Well, it's a good idea, really, because one, you get to keep your, I mean, you say you've got these beautiful uh, geraniums, they become, you become very attached to plants and, you know, why, why let, you want them to go on next year, don't they? They won't take the frost and bring them in. Some of these, Chris, are cuttings from my grandmother's geraniums. So, see, very, very important, you see, exactly. very important. They're like heirlooms almost. They really yeah. are. And uh, and it's very little effort. And uh, it means you're saving a few, Bob. Those geraniums are used to your garden, used to those conditions. It's a very simple and easy thing to do. And uh, I certainly, I've got a few begonias I'm very fond of. The odd pelagonium, they'll be coming in as houseplants through the winter. I'm quite excited now, Chris, because we're going to start something new, which is our plant of the month. And I know what a great plantsman you are. So each month I'm going to ask you, what do you want to highlight this particular month? So let's kick off. What's your plant for September? 
Well, I'm going to start with a, a nice, easy one, really easy to grow, very, very, very useful in the garden. Most people might see it. It's quite common. It's a plant called Sedum spectabilis, the ice plant. And it's almost very succulent-like in its foliage, very waxy leaves. It's hard as nails, to be honest with you. You, you know, it's a hard plant to kill. But the beauty of it, the beauty of it is it produces these big mop head umbels of sort of deep red flowers at the late in, a, in the season. And it's absolutely full of nectar. So you can go down an herbaceous border, in uh, late September, everything else is finishing. This plant will be in full go and it'll be covered in bees and butterflies. Superb late nectar source, okay? So I really recommend you don't need a lot of it. If you've got a little border, maybe put three of them in a clump. You can even grow it in a container, no problem. But look out for those bees and their butterflies and plant your sedum. What a brilliant idea. That's a sedum spectabile. Lovely. Great. Thank you, Chris. Well, thanks again. It's lovely to chat and share. I've got to Always. go off and deal with those cucumbers. <laughs> I've got to take a call yet out my call yet wine rack. <laughs> <laughs> take care, Chris. Bye bye. Bye cheers, Sarah. Bye bye. And now it's time to meet our guest, Dave Goulson. Dave is a professor at Sussex University. He's an inspiring teacher and writer, and he's travelled the world studying bees. He's this country's specialist on bumblebees. But his latest book, called Silent Earth, is about insects in general and how the world is losing them at a terrifying rate. You could call it a horror story. I'll let Dave explain. Dave, it's good to meet you. You too. Pleasure to be here. I've so enjoyed reading your book. It's one of those books that when you put it down or even while you're still reading it, you think, oh, everybody's got to read this. I know who I'm going to give it to. And you immediately want to spread the word. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, obviously, I'm, that's the idea. I would love it if as many people read it as possible and, and then did something, which I guess we'll come back to later. But uh, you know, the whole idea is to, is to stimulate people to, to get involved in actually helping save insects. And insects, of course, are the key part of the book. Let's start with that very first fundamental question. Why do insects matter? I mean, insects are amazing creatures in their own right. There's so many of them. They have extraordinary life cycles. Some of them are stunningly beautiful. Um, of course, they are hugely important. The ecosystem wouldn't function without them. They're, they they make up the bulk of life on Earth. They're food for all sorts of other creatures. You know, many birds and bats and uh, hedgehogs and uh, freshwater fish, amphibians. They all eat insects. So if the insects go, then they'll go. Ah, so there's that sort of interdependency, isn't there? It's not just food chain, it's just the whole biodiversity. Itself. Yeah, they're, they're a kind of vital part of the, of the food web. And, and actually, I think it's important that we shouldn't always look for things that they do that benefit us as a way of justifying them. I, I kind of think that that's a slightly self-centered way. It's, it's the way insect conservation, particularly bee conservation, is always presented but actually, you know, it isn't all about us. I think insects have as much right to be here as we do. And they've, they've been here a lot longer than us. They've been, you know, ruling the planet for the last 400 million years, long before we came along. And they also do lots and lots of other things. They recycle everything from dead bodies and, and cow pats to dead trees and leaves and so on. Uh, they help to keep the soil healthy. Of course, the thing they're famous for is they pollinate our crops, our garden flowers, our garden vegetables and fruits and farmers' fields. They're biocontrol agents of pests. And of course, they're often the pests themselves, so that not all insects are beneficial to us. But it, as, essentially, I mean, as E.O. Wilson put it, he's, he's a famous American biologist. I can't remember the exact quote, but he basically said that if people were to disappear from the planet, it would do very nicely without us. But that if insects were to somehow disappear, then the planet would collapse into chaos, was how he put it. And Gosh, he was really absolutely right. Yeah, it really shows how important they are. And it's just unfortunate, isn't it, that we tend to have a very a, a negative view of them. You know, we call them bugs. We call them creepy crawlies. You know, they scare people. And, they do. and it's such a shame that. It is. I mean, obviously, there are a few exceptions to that. You know, we, we love butterflies. Most people love bees, bumblebees in particular, because they're big and furry and colourful. But you're right. I mean, the, you know, the large majority of insects, we don't much like people react in horror if they find one in their house. Um, if it flies near them, they're most likely to swat it. It's really sad, actually, that we have this sort of negative perception of these amazing little creatures. Do you think that's lack of education? It's certainly partly lack of familiarity, I think. You know, most of us these days live in urban areas. 80% uh, of the British population lives in a, in a town or city. And so they don't encounter insects very often. 
I'm, I'm always struck by the fact that young children are fascinated by insects usually of course some of them are a bit frightened but if you take a bunch of primary school kids out into a, a wood or a meadow with nets and and get them to start catching and looking at things they love it they get so excited but by the time they're teenagers and adults they're frightened of the same creatures that they loved catching when they were six we get uh, squeamish don't we yeah and it's it's kind of sad and I, I i think the only explanation i can come up with is that we you know because we have little opportunity to kind of interact with them and to find out more about them you know in schools we don't really teach much natural history history generally uh, most teachers actually you know, in primary schools don't know terribly much about insects anyway so they wouldn't be able to teach about them ah oh, so there's that terrible vicious circle isn't there the less you know about them the less knowledge you have to pass on to the next generation yeah sadly i mean i, I was lucky i remember my uh, primary school teacher in my final year when i was about nine or ten she she loved natural history and she took us out pond dipping and identifying trees from the leaves and also you know it seemed like every day we were outside looking at nature but I don't think that's terribly common anymore and putting nature studies onto the curriculum would be just great wouldn't it yeah wouldn't it wouldn't it just I mean and it seems crazy to me really that we don't learn more about nature and the environment and, and things like growing how to grow your own food in school I mean that's such a fundamental human skill you know, being able to plant a seed and nurture a little plant and that kind of stuff. You know, why why don't we teach children from a young age how to do that? I find it amazing when I meet undergraduates, you know, in their, you know, their 19, 20, 21, and they've never grown anything. They've no idea how to plant a seed, you know. Yeah, yeah. Just as a little side, you write a fascinating description of metamorphosis. It's just to me is a miracle of life how a larvae can metamorphose, if that's the way of putting it, into a very beautiful butterfly. I mean, yeah. it's just a wonderful mystery. It's, it's perhaps what sort of first hooked me on insects. You know, I remember when I was, I don't know, about six years old, I, I found these little yellow and black stripy caterpillars, cinnabar moth caterpillars I now know, on some, some weeds on the edge of the playground. And I put them in my lunchbox and I took them home and I reared them up and they turned into these, you know, cinnabar moths, which are gorgeous, bright red and black creatures. So let's get on to the fact that, as you quite rightly say in your book, there has been a terrible decline in insects across the world. What, what evidence do you have to say that, Dave? It's first thing to is we should admit that there's there are huge gaps. The gaps are far bigger than the bits of knowledge we have. You know, there are 1.1 million species of insect that we've named and are thought to be another perhaps four or five million that exist that we haven't got around to identifying yet. So oh, obviously wow. we have no information at all on how they are faring because we don't, don't even know what they are yet. And for most of the ones we have now, there's no monitoring, there's no nobody regularly counting them. So there's a lot we don't know, but there are studies of insects that have gone on long term. And sadly, almost all of them show negative population trends. They're getting scarcer. Probably the, the best data set we have from perhaps anywhere in the world is for British butterflies, which have been monitored since 1976, uh, mainly mm -hmm. by volunteers walking transects counting butterflies. And this is a huge scheme with thousands of people involved, really impressive. But it reveals these really sad trends. You know, the common butterflies have declined, if I remember correctly, by 47% since 1976. And the rare ones are down 77% um, oh since gosh. since then. So, And these are butterflies we would see in our gardens, for instance? Well, the common ones, the ones that are down by, by uh, 47, that would be the, the peacocks, the white butterflies, the, but the everyday butterflies that we might see in gardens and urban areas. So they fared better, and not surprisingly, because they're obviously the sort of more adaptable ones. That's why we see them in gardens. Um, but the sort of specialised butterflies, you know, the fritillaries, the hair streaks, some of the blue butterflies and so on. Uh, three quarters of them have gone since, you know, I mean, I remember 1976, I was 11 years old, you know. So within my lifetime, we've lost, I mean, if you sort of pull the two together, more than 50% of, of our butterflies have disappeared. I mean, the real worry is if that carries on, and as far as, you know, all the evidence we have is that it, this is continuing, then, you know, what will the next generation grow up with? They'll end up in a world with very few butterflies indeed. Oh, it's a scary thought. Why do you think this is happening? What are the main causes? Yeah, 
there's been a lot of research on on the drivers of insect declines. And I think more or less everybody agrees that it, there's a whole array of kind of man-made problems that we've created for insects. It's, there's not a single cause. Um, habitat loss is a big one. Um, you know, we've, we've destroyed many of the most insect-rich habitats, particularly things like the lowland hay meadows that we used to have huge areas of in Britain and the chalk downlands that were full of flowers and rare insects. And also things like ancient woodlands and heathlands and, and uh, marshes and fens. Huge areas of all of these habitats have been swept away. And a lot of it's been replaced by intensively farmed land. And, and the intensification of farming is sort of goes hand in hand with habitat loss and is a big driver of insect declines. And of course, intimately associated with the intensification of farming has been the rise in pesticide use, which, mm. of course, is also contributing both directly through use of insecticides, which obviously kill insects, but also indirectly because herbicides enable farmers to, to grow their crops. You know, it's almost pure monocultures on, a, on huge scales and have eradicated most of the weeds from the landscape which again just sort of reduces the opportunities for insects, reduces the flowers in particular for, for pollinating insects. I remember hearing you talk a, a few years ago about how even though it, there, was a, there would be a wildflower strip down the side of an intensely agricultural field, the pesticides will still spread into that wildflower strip so that the pollinating insects, whether it's bees, hoverflies or whatever, are still taking up those herbicides. Yeah, I do suspect that the whole concept of sowing wildflower strips um, and, for, you know, paying farmers as we do through agri-environment schemes to sow wildflower strips immediately adjacent to arable crops that are being sprayed over and over again with pesticides is, is flawed. Um, if we want to create habitat for pollinators, we shouldn't do it in places where it's going to be exposed to pesticides. And, and we know, for example, if you take a sample of honey from a honeybee hive or from a bumblebee nest and analyze it, it will be full of pesticides. Wherever that hive or nest was in Britain or in the world, it will almost certainly contain a whole cocktail of different chemicals, uh, insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, and so on. Which and is not doing the bee any good. Of course it, it isn't. And if bees are being exposed if honeybees and bumblebees are then that means that all pollinating insects that they you know they're all visiting the same flowers essentially they're all being exposed and that's thousands of species i mean just in the uk there are thought to be about 6000 species of insect that visit flowers and pollinate them so that's 6000 species of insect that we're all all being poisoned by mm. agricultural practices and as a human being, we might decide, OK, I'm not going to go down that route. I'm only going to buy, grow organic fruit or veg. But the insect doesn't have that choice because the insect doesn't know any better. No. And of course, that's one of the sad things is the insects can't tell. And, and if you're unlucky and, you know, you, for example, you have a garden and, uh, and you garden organically, but your neighbour or Perhaps you have a field, if you live in the countryside next door, that's having pesticides sprayed on it. Unfortunately, you can't tell the insects in your garden not to go over the hedge, you know. <laughs> Whatever you do, unfortunately, you can't escape the fact that, uh, you know, your insects are likely to be poisoned. It's a sobering thought. But let's bring it back to gardeners and what gardeners can do. What would you say would be the most effective thing we could do in our gardens to stop this decline? I guess the nice thing here is that there are loads of things that gardeners can do and it's you know in that sense it's very different to a lot of these big kind of depressing environmental issues you know like I've seen the rainforest being burnt down or whatever where you feel completely helpless actually it, you know there are lots of species of insects living in our garden there's this extraordinary um, study done by a lady called Jenny Owen who lived in urban Leicester had a little eighth of an acre garden and she spent 35 years identifying everything she could find in her garden. And after, after 35 years, she, she came up with this extra, amazing total of, if I remember correctly, 2,673 different species of animal and plant that she'd found in her little garden during her wow. life. Nearly 2,000 of them were different types of insects. So, you know... Gardens can support amazing diversity of life. 
And all we have to do is is actually often is do less, just welcome it in. I, I slightly am arachnophobic, which I'm really embarrassed to admit, but I always have been. But my greenhouse is full of spiders, particularly the big um, garden orb spiders. The females are, you know, rather fearsome, chunky looking creatures in their, their big webs. But they do an amazing job of keeping the, the, the pests down in, in the greenhouse. And so, you know, I do occasionally get one on my head when I'm amongst the tomatoes but it's worth it really for the for the job they do I I have very few pest problems at all thanks to the spiders I was going to say it's another instance isn't it of being slightly relaxed in your approach to gardening not always tidying up not always making everything look immaculate yeah it's 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 frustrating isn't it because it does go against the grain with many of us you know people humans do seem to have this instinct for tidiness but actually if you can fight it if you can you know persuade yourself to relax and and not get the mower out not get the pesticide spray out just do less and you know learn to love a shaggy lawn and and spiders and all the rest of it then you know the world would be a lot healthier and not feel judged by it i think that's the danger i think we think people will judge us and think that we're lazy that that is absolutely uh, a battle um you know there for example if you have things like dandelions or thistles in your garden many people w- would immediately think well you're you're an incompetent gardener you know you shouldn't have these things um because we've all been taught up to think that those are terrible weeds but of course actually you know they're flowers they're native they're beautiful um if you if you just stop for a minute to think about it and look at them you know a thistle flower is gorgeous and they're really popular with pollinators so you know the, it, we do need to try try to kind of reevaluate how we look at that kind of thing and don't use pesticides is a pretty obvious place to start we, I, yesterday i launched a petition calling on government to ban sale of pesticides to gardeners and also to ban their use in urban areas by the council. Uh, often they spray herbicide along the streets and so on. And, you know, I, in my dream world, nobody would be using pesticides in our towns. France has already done this. Um, they have banned pesticide use in, in towns. Uh, and if they can do it, we can do it. And, so, and stop the sale of them in, in garden centres and such. I'm 100% in agreement. And, and, you know, I say that from experience, as I'm sure you do. Uh, in fact, I posted a little YouTube video just the other day where I am um, in my veggie patch. I always grow runner beans, of course, everybody does. And almost every spring I get an outbreak of black bean aphids. And I, so I filmed it over a couple of weeks. You know, to start with, there were a few aphids. A few days later, there were a lot of aphids. And it looks, you know, there are thousands of them crusting the stem all over the undersides Those of the leaves. black leaf. things that crawl Yeah, up. yeah. yeah. I mean, it, looks re- it looks horrendous. And you think, oh, my God, my plants are all going to die. But if you just hold your nerve and do nothing, which is what I did, instead of rushing off to get the bug spray from the garden centre, actually, it's amazing. Within two weeks, there's not a single aphid on there, not one. They were just completely obliterated by, uh, you know, a whole army of ladybirds and lacewings and blue tits with their pecking away and all sorts of other creatures. I, you know, and it, so it really does work. It's not just sort of this myth that uh, organic gardeners, you know, say biocontrol works. It does. The thing is, even if it didn't work completely effectively and I got a slightly reduced runner bean crop because of the aphids, I'd still rather that than have runner beans I'd sprayed pesticide onto. It just seems completely mad. I think it also goes back to what you said earlier about we have this very human-centred view of the planet and our relationship with nature. What do insects do for me or what do insects do for humanity? Instead of thinking, actually, in my garden, I'm just one form of wildlife yeah. and there's so many other forms around me. Can we just coexist? Absolutely. I mean, I would, it, wouldn't it be great if people kind of respected nature and saw ourselves as part of nature rather than kind of feeling that we have the right to just destroy to control to to try and force everything we have at the moment uh, this very dysfunctional attitude to to the environment I I think I've given quite a lot of thought to this and I think it, it comes from a history of gardening and I think when gardens started to be created as formal environments in well you could go back as far as the 17th century but certainly in the past couple of centuries it is all about control because probably their nature was much wilder, full of life and and buzzing with wildlife. The human beings felt they wanted to control that and they wanted to make their mark. So it was almost like they were pushing nature away and having within their own gardens productivity, of course, but also beauty and ornament. But I think we no longer have that anymore. 
you know, here we are in the 21st century and our nature beyond our garden walls is actually very depleted. And it's interesting to see that reversal that we now feel we need to put the nature back in within the garden walls. Yeah, it, it is really interesting. I mean, I, I guess, you know, you don't have to go back that many decades and there was no conservation movement. It, it just hadn't occurred to people that that we could wipe out nature, that, that nature would ever disappear. It was, you know, it had always been there and it just seemed impossible, unimaginable that the, the seas would be empty of fish, that there would be no butterflies in the garden. But actually, that's exactly where we're going to be if we don't do something soon. So, uh, But it is really exciting because there is this, this sort of garden wilding or rewilding or whatever movement. People want more nature. Not everybody, of course. There are still people putting down astroturf lawns and the like, which just depresses the hell out of me. But there are lots of people that, that want to see more life and more or more wildflowers and so on in their garden. So we've forgotten I was talking about why <laughs> what gardeners can do. <laughs> so obviously don't don't use pesticides. We'll take that as red. But then there are loads of other things. So don't mow so often and ideally leave some of your lawn as a kind of meadow for, with an annual cut. Grow pollinator friendly flowers. Um, there's lots of information out there. I've made lots of YouTube videos about the ones that I grow. Include wildflowers in that. There's lots of evidence that, that on average, wildflowers support more life than non natives. Pond, of course, is fantastic even a little tiny one be a hotel or two if you can leave a little i'm glad you mentioned that because bug hotels are on every sort of garden center gift shelf or whatever do they actually work dave well the bee hotels solitary bee hotels do work or at least most of them do i okay I... let's unpack this let's take the word hotel out of it because that is part of sales speak so yeah. what you're doing is you're creating a habitat for a solitary bee to nest in and produce their young Yes, precisely. So solitary bees, which actually uh, something mo many people are unaware of, is the majority of species are solitary um, in the UK. So they're not honeybees? No, exactly. So we have just over 270 species of bee, of which about 26 are t different types of bumblebee, which live in a colony with a queen and workers. And there's the honeybee, the sort of domestic animal, which is just one species. But then there are, there are nearly 250 other species of bee, and most of them nobody ever even notices. Quite a lot of them will live in our gardens, and they all need somewhere to nest. Now, some of them nest in the ground. Um, actually, the majority dig into the ground. And if you're lucky, you might get those in your garden, things like tawny mining bees in the lawn or ivy bees. But some like to nest in, in horizontal holes. And probably naturally, they would have nested in beetle holes bored in dead trees. But in the sort of modern tidy world, where as soon as a tree looks a bit poorly, it gets chopped down and burned, there aren't many natural beetle holes left for these bees. But it's really easy to create holes for them. And so these kind of bee nesting sites, <laughs> hotels, whatever you want to call them, are basically providing horizontal tunnels, little holes of roughly eight millimeter diameter, which can be made really easily for free. You don't need to buy one. I mean, a piece of wood and a drill is all you need. Uh, or you can chop up bits of bamboo cane or whatever you like. Uh, and they're pretty effective. I mean, I've, I've got probably a dozen of them in my garden of various homemade and, and bought designs that people have given me. And nearly all of them get some bees in them. And some of them are I've got hundreds of bees in there. They're alive, particularly red mason bees in the spring. Oh, wow. I, just on the side wall of the house to my left as I'm sitting here talking to you <laughs> I can I can see my bee hotels and they're they're, they're more or less finished for the year now uh, because they're the bees that use them are mainly spring active but they're they're fantastic for pollinating fruit trees so worth encouraging these mason bees that use bee hotels um, for the not well obviously I, I love to see them anyway whether they were pollinating or not but they're on the wing at, all, at the same time as uh, apples and pears in particular and you see them busy pollinating the flowers and there's been some scientific studies suggesting that they're much more effective pollinators than honeybees actually for for hard fruits so well worth encouraging in your garden. Oh, that's interesting. Actually, that slightly brings me on to beyond the garden, to allotments. Now, you wrote that the amazing fact about allotments is that they have a higher insect diversity than any other green area in the city, beyond gardens, beyond parks, cemeteries or whatever. So th this comes from a, a, a university study. I mean, it was led by uh, Kate Baldock, who's Bristol University, but it was a national study in lots of cities. And they 
quantified insect diversity in, in lots of different habitats, including even urban nature reserves. And allotments came out top, which, I mean, I think is fantastic news. I guess it's because allotments are so diverse. You know, within that few acres patch, you've got sort of semi-derelict allotments, be some with weeds and a bit overgrown, others that are full of ornamental flowers, others that are full of vegetables. You know, it's so packed into that tiny area. You've got an incredible diversity of different plants and flowers and so on. And that's what supports the, the, the diversity of wildlife. But also, the, I think the really interesting thing is that as well as supporting wildlife, allotments are producing food and, and quite a lot of it. Mm. Um, uh, and so it demonstrates something which I think is really important, that, which is that growing food and supporting wildlife don't have to be mutually exclusive. So modern farming is essentially just trying to get rid of everything apart from the crop and create these terribly bleak, huge monocultures. It doesn't have to be like that. Actually, the, the productivity of a, of a, a well-managed allotment can be much higher than a, an intensively managed field, despite the difference in chemical inputs. So it's like um, the old fashioned mixed farm, isn't it? The small scale farm. That yeah. Is. And the irony is there's, there's actually an abundance of academic studies, of scientific evidence showing that small farms are more productive per acre or hectare than, than large farms. And yet for the last 60, 70 years, we've basically subsidized the sort of industrialization of farming so that farms have got bigger and bigger and bigger, but actually we'd be producing more food if we'd gone in the opposite direction and, and we'd have way more people employed in the farming sector and we'd probably have an awful lot more biodiversity. So I, I kind of think we've gone down a dead end when it comes to food production and lot, allotments give us a clue as to how we could do things differently. Uh, wouldn't it be great if, you know, government would free up more land for allotments because there is a demand there. There are 90,000 mm. 90, people on waiting lists for allotments, can't get them because the land isn't available. These are people who want to grow their own zero food miles, zero packaging, healthy fruit and veg, um, mm. and they can't. How frustrating is, is that? I think it's really important to, to, to acknowledge the importance of allotments and gardens. I did some figures on the back of an envelope the other day and worked out that if you take the average size garden plus the allotments plus community gardens, public parks, you will get an area the size of Northumberland. Wow. I mean, imagine if that whole area could be grown organically without pesticides, with that wonderful diversity that you're talking about, the plant diversity as well as the wildlife diversity. Don't you think that would be just so powerful? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That 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 is more or less my dream. And if one could also add in influence the way councils manage road verges and roundabouts and parks, cemeteries, all these other urban green spaces, together with the gardens, that's a national network of potentially wildlife rich habitat, which you know would really make a difference. It's it's not going to solve all the world's problems, but it would be a really big step in the right direction. So let's go back to the book again and heard about this insect apocalypse, this terrible thing that's happening. And, and you deliberately call it Silent Earth, I guess, as in homage to Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. Mm -hmm. But you do have at the end of the book a whole list of actions that everyone can do to help turn this around. Are there any particular ones that you want to highlight that anyone listening to this podcast now could go and do? Uh, it's hard to pick out any one because there are so many things we can do. And, and really, we need to do as many of them as possible. So I'm, I'm sidestepping your question slightly. <laughs> Clearly, if you're a gardener, then there's a huge amount you can do in your own patch. And that's great. And um, we've, we've already talked a lot about that. But we also have a lot of influence beyond, don't we, you know, in, in terms of who we vote for. And so, you know, voting for politicians that, that have a green agenda, whether that's the Green Party or whoever you choose, in the long run makes a difference. Uh, and in our shopping choices, that too could make a huge difference. You know, I mean, to, to, to be simplistic, if we all bought organic food, there would be no pesticides in the world. Uh, it would take a while. Obviously, the, the supply would have to catch up with the demand. But it's as simple as that. It's in our power to change the way we farm. And, and it's not just organic food, I would argue, but, uh, you know, ideally we should all try to buy seasonal, locally produced food, eat more fruit and veg and less meat. Um, it's, it's a really easy thing to do and it massively reduces your personal impact on the planet. So, you know, there are lots of ways that, that we can all do something positive. 
you can get involved in local campaigns to, to influence the council to reduce mowing of road verges, to reduce pesticide use, assuming my petition doesn't get the government to do it for them, uh, and so on and so on. You know, there are lots of things anyone can get involved in. And, and it, really, we ought to all be trying to get involved in as many of them as, as possible. And that's, that's how we'll change things, you know, a sort of grassroots bottom up movement. Bringing it down to the individual, isn't it? And just the conversations you have with, with friends and colleagues, I hate to say it, but actually reading your book, which is very, very inspirational, all these things, I think, will help us articulate what needs to be done and, and spur us into action. Give us hope, Dave, give us hope. <laughs> you well, say that insects do come back if given the right habitat. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's extraordinary how quickly they can recover um, if, if we, you know, give them some space. If, if more of us start inviting nature in to live in our gardens, it will come. And, you know, most insects, thankfully, haven't gone extinct yet. They could recover really quickly if we provide the right conditions for them. So, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't give up. I mean, it, it's easy to get despondent, isn't it? But, but, you know, it isn't yet too late to save most of them. So we should jolly well get on and do it. I'm going to ask a cheeky question just to end. I'm particularly bugged by ants in my garden. They get into every single pot that I have. Are there any insects that you truthfully would rather not have in your garden? <laughs> um, I'm struggling to think of any. I, I, the nearest I can come, I suppose, is a pretty obvious choice. Uh, we've, we've got a little place in France uh, that we go on hot, a little farmhouse with a meadow all around it, which is a kind of wildlife reserve. Um, but there are a lot of livestock kept nearby and there are a lot of house flies that live around there. And I know, I, you know, I, I tell myself they're really important as food for the swallows and the house <laughs> martins and the bats and everything else. But when you're trying to eat your lunch and they're <laughs> buzzing all around you and, and you're accidentally getting them in your mouth and everything else they're quite dave, hard to love dave thank you very much it's been such a delight talking to you and thank you for giving us hope despite the awful statistics to do with with insects i know as organic gardeners we can do our bit not least sign your petition and there'll be details about that later but thank you dave thank you it's been a pleasure thought such a lover of insects would be mildly arachnophobic and hate flies. If you want to sign the petition to Parliament asking them to ban the domestic use of pesticides, then the best thing to do is type into your internet search just three words, petition, ban, insecticide. You should then get a link to the Parliamentary Petition website. Alternatively, you'll find more information on our Garden Organic website news pages. Please sign this petition for the sake of our butterflies and bees and for our children and our grandchildren. And if you want to read Dave's book, it's called Silent Earth, available from all independent booksellers. OK, so now it's time to open the podcast post bag and I'm joined by Chris and Anton. Hi, both. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Anton. Hi, Sarah. Let's start off. We've had a, a listener write in and say, I've read that this month is Organic September. I'd like to ask the panel why they think organic is important. So, meaty subject there, Chris. What would you say to that? <laughs> yeah, that is a big, there's a big profound angle to that one for sure. Well, obviously, I'm, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put aside maybe the politics of it or the environmental concerns. I'm going to speak very personally about it because all those things are relevant. But also there's one key factor for me and that has been an organic gardener, I think takes me much closer to the subject matter. So, for instance, when I started as a gardener, it was very formal, it was very controlling. The priority was on the gardener and what the gardener wanted. Now I see a gardener as a much more shared space. I love to see a hoverfly, I love to see a bee. Without bird life, what would it be? So I see it as a shared space, but I also see it as it engages me much closer. I need to look, I need to observe. I, my bonding with my plants is much greater as an organic gardener. It's a one-on-one -on -one between me and my garden. I like the personal approach of being an organic gardener. And Chris, would it be true to say that by having that close approach and your close observation, you're preventing disease? Because the organic way is to prevent disease rather than treat it, isn't it? Absolutely. Otherwise, it's just crisis management, isn't it? You see a, you see a problem and you, you attack it and then you walk away. I'm always ahead of the game. My allotment's a good example, my balcony. I see it every day. I look at it every day. And therefore, if I see problems developing, I'm always ahead of the game because I'm engaged in it. And that's what I love about being an organic gardener. Yeah, that's very valid. Anton, what are your thoughts on the question? 
Well, I think very much from a sustainability point of view, I think because we've all got a little bit of space, but we're all making a contribution to, to the whole. And I always think it's very important to think about the sort of resources you're using in gardening. We're always encouraged to try and buy lots of stuff. That's, that's what garden centres want us to do. But in fact, I always think the sort of less stuff that comes into your garden, the better, the more that you can sort of recycle and reuse that you're really sort of doing your bit for the environment. And main thing that anybody can do is having a compost bin. You really are sort of making a big impact by doing that. You're saving your sort of green waste being taken away in a big lorry and then processed industrially. Probably they're going to sell it back to you in a plastic bag, a soil improver. So I think the more closed loop cycles you've got within your garden and the better use of resources, and that's what organic is all about, then I think that's a really good thing. I think that's great stuff. I agree with you. The, the word sustainable is so important here. I agree with Chris as well that in today's climate emergency, it's all too easy to feel powerless as an individual. But by taking action as a gardener in your own plot of land, whether it's a garden, an allotment or, or a balcony, and if you follow the organic principles, you're some way you will be mitigating the worst. Because not only does it increase the biodiversity around you, but it also empowers you to know that you're helping the planet rebalance. I'm, I'm remembering what Dave Goulson said when I was talking to him earlier, that with a few thoughtful actions in our organic growing space, we can bring back insects, which in turn will support other wildlife. So no matter how small your growing space, all that life, it's buzzing, crawling, flying, singing, gathering seeds and nectar. It has as much right to be here as much as us humans do. I really, really do believe that. And I think organic growing embodies us as part of that web of life. Well said. I'd really go along with that. I mean, I think that the life that we're sharing with the garden is just as important as all the stuff we're trying to grow. I mean, personally, from a personal point of view, I get just as much joy out of watching a hoverfly buzz around and decide which flower it's going to visit next as picking a ripe tomato. And if I want to procrastinate, I'll go and spend 10 minutes just with my head staring in the compost bin, just looking at the amount of wildlife that's living in there. It's like a zoo in a bin. It's fantastic. So, yeah, I think just really respecting those processes and respecting that. Well, they were all there first, weren't they? I think it's always important to say as well, because you can easily feel lost in the whole environmental thing. There's such a, so much going on. You think, well, you know, it's like sometimes I feel like I'm turning up at a major earthquake with a dustpan and brush to try and sweep up. It feels <laughs> like that sometimes. But every little action creates a bigger action. So if a million people garden organically, that means there's improvement. Let's all muck together and make a difference. Absolutely, Chris. Thank you. And um, I should just mention that Garden Organic is part of the Organic September movement. And every day in September, there'll be an organic gardening tip, which if you follow us on Instagram, will remind you just how important it is to grow organically. OK, moving on. Uh, someone else has written in saying, I'd like to put some gooseberry bushes in my allotment and raspberries. Is now a good time to plant them? Chris, what do you think? I, I am a big believer in autumn planting for, for one reason, really, mainly. And that is because the soil will still be warm and it gives it the whole winter, gives the plant the whole winter to get its roots down. It's not concentrating on photosynthesis and all the other jobs it needs to do. It can concentrate literally on root establishment. That means when it hits the spring, it can start getting going. You're not going to, need to water it all the time. It's already an established plant. The roots are the key to a successful plant. And by planting in autumn, that means you give it the strongest possible go ahead. Yes, I'd just go along with Chris, really. Um, having something growing through the winter really gives it a chance to get its roots established. One thing I'd like to do is um, put a shout out for bare root plants as well. I, I think it's a more sustainable way of sourcing your plants. What, what you're doing is you're, you're taking a plant with bare roots um, from a nursery and then putting it straight into the environment that it's going to be growing in. So it's really getting established. Whereas if you buy something that's in a pot, it's, the chances are that it's been mollycoddled for quite a while. And then it's quite a shock when you put it in, in the garden. Also, from a sustainability point of view, um, it's 
pretty likely that those potted plants have been grown in peat as well. So it's obviously much easier to avoid peat if you're buying bare root plants. Obviously, a potted plant, you can plant at any time of year, but really, I, I think that's a bit unnatural, really. We want to be going for winter planting, which is the normal time for planting fruit bushes. I can understand quite a few people saying, how do I get hold of a bare root plant? Because it's so much easier to go to a local garden centre. You can get bare root garden centres, but normally normally you more go to a wholesale grower, I think is where you'd get more likely to get bare root plants. Garden centres tend to buy their stuff bulk, probably grown in Holland. I love the explanation about, you know, Molly Cold. I always think of basil in a in a, in a supermarket. Why does it die? It's because it's come from Buck Palace into, your, into a bed seal almost, because there's that transition. It's all nurtured. And then you take it away and it's not in the same environment. Bare roots, which come from wholesalers, particularly trees, fruit, that kind of stuff, is more likely to be local grown in the local environment. So as Anton says, it's already got the resilience for that to establish itself in your garden. That's very important. And if you can't buy local, it's actually not that difficult to do a bit of online searching. You'll find quite a few organic nurseries that are, are producing fruit, bushes and, and other plants. It's really worth, I think, that little bit more of investigation. I'm just going to add to the discussion I think it's a brilliant idea to grow fruit because fruit is difficult to buy organic if not impossible I've never seen organic gooseberries and if you really are concerned about your low food miles and about eating organic food then as much fruit as possible in your growing area I think is a great idea now our last question is is it too late to do any sowing this month Anton, what are your thoughts? Well, obviously, this depends a little bit where you are in the country, because people who are in London and the southeast and the southwest, I'd say beginning of September would be fine for sowing, particularly salads. There are lots of lovely salads that you can grow. And I would say don't just go for the sort of ones that you see in a supermarket like rocket and lettuce. Go for some of the more exciting things. That's the point of growing stuff at home is that you can grow stuff that's not in the supermarket. Market. So go for some of the exciting spicy leaves like Mizuna and there's green and snow mustard. I particularly like the really hot winter red mustards as well. Then there are things which look great as well. There's purple frills mustard with those lovely sort of fine frilly purple leaves. There's golden frills mustard that actually tastes a little bit like garlic as well. It's quite amazing, really. They'll, they'll produce well into sort of early March time, whereas Rocket will have bolted and given up the ghost by then. Getting further north towards the Midlands and perhaps even up to sort of the north of the country and into Scotland, I'd say it's a bit more touch and go. I'd certainly say in Scotland, probably a bit late for sowing salads. In, in the Midlands, I would say if you get a good September then it's, and you sow pretty early as, as soon as you can, then that should be, should be fine. And I'm glad you mentioned the geographical difference across the UK. I think there's also another difference, which is the beginning of September can quite often be quite different to the end of the month. At the beginning of September, we still kid ourselves we're in summer and we've got it's almost August. By the end of the month, I reckon we well, we probably have had a first frost and the soil temperature has gone right down. So if you are going to be doing any sowing of these lovely salad leaves, then I'd get cracking. There's also lots of other things you can be planting a bit later. So there's um, overwintered onions, which you can buy as sets and you can plant them in October. And also things like overwintered broad beans as well. Um, they will do fine. Um, if you're growing further north, I would probably have a go at growing field beans because they're a bit more resilient. But it would mean you'll get a nice early crop, both of onions and of beans next year. Chris, what do you think? Yes, yeah, certainly. Well, I... Um... I'm never without a little bit of fresh food because I, I do a little thing called a mini allotment, which is basically microgreens. We've all microgreens have got a lot of traction in recent years. We, we hear about them a lot. And they are a very easy way to keep fresh food, fresh salads, particularly or sandwich fillers into my kitchen right throughout the winter and I basically what I do is I get an old tray I've got a couple of those and then I save plastic mushroom pallets or tomato pallets things you buy out of the, you know you buy from a shop I save them they've already always got drainage holes in already because obviously the the produce needs to be kept fresh and then I line them up in that drip tray put in my peat free compost and then I will sow into that pea shoots. I like, I love beetroot seedlings. I absolutely adore those. Uh, Anton's tip for me was celery tops. I've really enjoyed those as well. Um, I'll maybe use radish also. So I'll sow all these very thickly 
into that soil, sim over the top of them, and they come up very quickly. I put it in the windowsill, and that means I crop them with a pair of scissors. 10, 11 days later, they can go straight into the salad or my sandwich. This tends to work all the way through the winter, even in the dark months. And what I'll then do is I'll have another four pallets to the side and I'll sow them five days in. It's just a really effective way of keeping young, fresh salad leaves into your food on a daily basis throughout the winter. It really, really works. Chris, that's really inspiring. And, and both of you, I'm full of ideas now as to what to sow and where to sow. Have a good September and we'll see you again next month. See you, Sarah. See you, Anton. See you both. Well, I hope you enjoyed our organic September episode. Next month, Chris will be going down memory lane with his old mentor, George Anderson, who is head of Edinburgh Botanic Gardens for nearly 40 years. And we'll be discussing seed saving and other autumn tasks. If you want to follow up on any of the topics we've discussed, visit the Garden Organic website. You'll find a page on the Organic Gardening podcast. Why not subscribe? Then you won't miss an episode. And that way you can post us a review. We always like hearing from you. And finally, my thanks to the Organic Gardening Catalogue for sponsoring us. And to you for listening. Have a wonderful, golden, organic September. Thanks to Kevin McLeod for providing the music. Music.